So we're going to the second panel of the day, which is on verticality and horizontality uh, between Lucille Tanazas and Jeff Howe. Um, Lucille is both an educator and a graphic designer. Her studio, Tanazas Design, was based in San Francisco for 20 years, but relocated to New York in 2006, returning to the city where she originally began her practice in 1982. She is the Henry Wolf Professor in the School of Art, Media, and Technology at Parsons, where she's developing a graduate concentration in design, craft, and technology. Previously, she was the founding chair of the MFA program in design at California College of the Arts in San Francisco. And she's wearing her glad rags today because she's being honored with the AIGA medal, representing one of the highest honors in graphic design. Jeff Howe is Associate Professor and Chair of Landscape Architecture at the University of Washington, Seattle. His research, teaching, and practice focus on engaging marginalized communities and citizens through community design, design activism, and cross-cultural learning. He has worked with indigenous tribes, farmers, and fishers in Taiwan, neighborhood residents in Japan, villages in China, and inner city immigrant youths and elders in North American cities in projects ranging from the conservation of wildlife habitats to build, rebuilding of indigenous villages and design, and the design of urban open space and streetscapes. He's the editor of Insurgent Public Space, Guerrilla Urbanism, and the Remaking of Contemporary Cities, and a co-author of Greening Cities, Growing Communities, Learning from Urban Community Gardens in Seattle. <coughs> Lucille. Thank you. Um, um, anyway, when, when I was approached by Radhika early, uh, I guess sometime in the fall last year about being involved in the symposium, I was trying to figure out what, my, how, what I can contribute as a graphic designer, uh, but th because I felt that the common denominator was at least I was from an Asian city. <laughs> and I thought I could, I could talk about that. So I'm, uh, I'm originally from the Philippines. I was born in the Philippines in one of the central provinces. But I showed this slide because this is, to me, quintessential of what my country is about, or at least two aspects of it. Uh, w the, the image on the top is a very well-known uh, public conveyance called the jeepney, which is actually a recycling um, result of uh, when the Americans left the... Uh, American jeeps in after wor Second World War, and so the Filipinos came upon these um, remains and decided to use it and reuse it, but in a different way, in a sort of typically Filipino way. So it's overly decorated. This is actually quite subtle. I mean, so you can imagine what an overly done jeepney is about. But this really puts you in in very, very close contact with people uh, as, as, uh, in, in a small amount, uh, you know, a small number of people, not like a bus, but in this case, you're actually facing each other. Uh, so it kind of like in the subway where you try to avoid eye contact, <laughs> but uh, you're very close to people. So the sort of intensity of an Asian city, I think, is replicated in, this, in, this, in the jeepney. The bottom image, to me, is sort of quintessential of my country's kind of fascination with beauty contests. Um, and this is like your Miss, um, these are Miss Philippines, Miss International candidates for, uh, you know, whatever. Uh, and every year, I remember when I was growing up, um, we would all be seated in front of the TV and watching three hour long pageants and, um, you know, uh, vicariously kind of experiencing what the world w realized about these Filipino women because we are, in a way, this sort of hybrid. You know, you can't quite tell whether we're Malaysian, whether we're Indonesian, whether we're from Thailand. Um, and so you have the range. And I think if you look at any Filipino, it's, it's this sort of hybrid. We're brown Malay stock, but we're, e we're either of Chinese or Spanish ancestry. Okay, here's, here's a little bit of geography, but you all know where it is because we're talking about Asia. Uh, my country, um, the Philippines, is made up of 7,000 islands, which I don't know you knew. Um, we were under the Spanish rule for 300 years, from 1611 to the turn of the 21st century, when the Americans came. We were under American rule for 50 years, and because of the 7,000 islands, uh, we have over 50 dialects, and that accounts for our kind of spread out 
um, regionalism uh, even more magnified than just very you know plainly north and south. There are a lot of nuances in terms of um, distinctions between dialects and behavior and even many cultures. This is something I did many years ago when I was being asked to visualize my country in a kind of, um, I, I, I guess, an iconic way. And I thought um, separating the letters uh, and, and fragmenting the letters represented for me the separation of islands, but also the, the kind of conflicting um, shape, or not conflicting, I'm sorry, the uh, over um, restrictive shape, I guess, of the cruciform s as emblematic uh, by our Catholic religion uh, and the Spanish rule. So we, in a way, I think we, we are burdened by religion. We are the only Catholic country in Southeast Asia. And so that, uh, that reflects um, our kind of mixed allegiances. Here's Makati, which is the biggest uh, metropolitan area. Actually, Man Man metropolitan Manila is made up of many different mini cities that are attached together, connected together. This is Makati, which is sort of our Wall Street, but you can see that right next to it is the sort of horizontality of, uh, of uh, slums, and slum areas, as well as middle class, and, and they, we all mix in the malls. I mean, this is the sort of typical scenario uh, in Manila, which is made up of over a million people, over, spread out over 24 square miles. So you can imagine the density, uh, and, and we're talking 100 degree humidity as well. Um, here's another view of that, uh, m public markets. Um, because it's a Catholic country, there's no birth control, or at least not publicly. <laughs> uh, uh, so this is where I think religion is a, it becomes kind of a, a, a problematic issue. This is a w wonderful quote that I picked up from James Fallows many years ago, which really epitomizes the sort of ambiguity that Filipinos feel. You know, we, the very kindness of American rule, when they came at the, at the, at the end of the Spanish-American War to rescue us from the Spanish, um, they came bearing goodwill, of course. And so they wanted to give us an, um, the American system of government, the American system of education. And so we are, we are born um, speaking two languages, you know, so we are bilingual from birth in a way, you know, so we are taught English in school and uh, we learn or we speak our spoken language, a national language, which is only in fact spoken in Manila in the metropolitan area. So because my parents come from another province, I speak another language or another dialect. So uh, maybe if you call that trilingual, uh, and because a lot of Filipinos are Spanish of our Spanish ancestry, like my name is Tanazas, which means um, pincers or tongs, and in fact where tenacity comes from, um, that uh, we sort of have this mix in our, in our cultural mindset. So uh, when it comes to my work, uh, you know, coming here to the United States when I was in, uh, this was in the late 70s, 1979, um, I didn't understand, I thought, okay, what do I make of my work and my background? And um, I realized that there were two things that I think define my work, and one is my interest in typography, specifically because of my interest in language, um, and also fragmentation. And uh, I think uh, I've never really seen things in a whole, as a whole. A lot of things are broken apart uh, to make a whole. Uh, and then I assume that I really give a lot of trust to the viewer so that they can make their own narratives and make their own stories based on what I'm showing them typographically. So th this is actually a couple of cover ideas that I did for a book on poetry and anthology. The, the one on the left shows you my interest in sort of the mechanics of poetry and poetic structure um, and looking at it from a sort of very purely architectonic quality. But then I was curious, in fact, what they would think of the one on the right, so I submitted both, because I told them that the one on the right, which in fact replaces the, uh, the words with dots uh, as, as you know, looking like notations, um, I thought it was a leap of faith for them to go for that. But actually, surprisingly, they went for the second one. So I was very pleased that they uh, assumed that people are smart enough and intelligent enough to make those connections. Um, Something else I'm interested in is sort of this wordplay, um, which I think is really born out of my 
you know, my, my experience of being raised in a country where English was spoken in a strict way, very academic, uh, with my hands tied behind my back, so I couldn't really play with it, if you will. Um, and so when I came to the United States, for my, you know, further, further education, I thought, oh, wow, now I can really be, you know, be dealing with the nuance and, and be a little more experimental um, with the words and break it down and, and, and look at meaning in different ways. So, I mean, here, this is a, a poster for the San Francisco Museum of Modern Art for their lecture series uh, entitled Sublime Subversives. And so subversives is, you know, using the kind of um, uh, semantic device there up, turned upside down. But also other words that re deal with subversive are, are there within the yellow frame, but they're not totally complete. Uh, again, it's like the missing links, but um, through, through the collective in the joining of those words or phrases or um, prefixes, suffixes, uh, you're able to come up with a meaning. Another example of that, you know, the sort of fragmentation uh, for a similar project, this is a, a lecture series also by SFMOMA and the AIA, um, this was in 2000. So recently, when I was uh, when I was hired by Parsons to rethink what a graduate program in design would be or in communication design, I was also involved with doing projects for um, uh, other programs or other departments. This is for the School of Constructed Environments, and um, I'm always interested, in fact, in the sort of duality of things. You know, in in in, in this case, actually, this is the shadow. Um, shadow of the front. So here you can take a look at the kind of conjoined, uh, hybridized uh, image that uses many different projects put together. And then the back is essentially the outline. And I, I guess I don't want to say the back because, you know, it means like, you know, there's a front and back. I like to say that it's side one and side two. So that I don't really prefer, I don't have any preferences, uh, although I prefer the one in the, on the right. Uh, and then, of course, with this design on the poster, um, you know, I'm, I'm, I really welcome a lot of text. I mean, I'm, I'm the kind of designer that the more the text, I like it. Because I, I like how I can organize information in ways that are dense, but are actually quite organized, uh, are, are, are accessible. I think because my father was a civil engineer, so there's a left brain kind of acting up, and then my mother was a history teacher. And so there was this sort of a more intuitive sensibility, or liberal arts, I guess, if you will, that sort of made its, uh, you know, met its match in me. And so I, when, when uh, Asim gave me all this information, I said, is there more? Uh, in fact, the, the bios are mine. <laughs> I said, I think we need more information. Well, we should identify these people. And so it was a way for me to kind of, uh, you know, add different layers as if it was like this weaving of information, if you will. And then lastly, I just want to, uh, this is a way, I, a way I define myself, you know, a quote that a friend of mine said, uh, because I have lived in, you know, now in the United States for over 30 years, uh, and I lived for a year in Rome uh, sometime in the mid-2000s, and, you know, I realized when I talk about my work and myself and my trajectory, that I have traveled from the Philippines to the east, uh, west first, California, and then I went to Cranbrook, and then w uh, east, and then asked to return to California, and then now I'm back east, um, it's a very, it's, you know, this phrase, uh, the sentence for me is so revealing that, you know, yet you travel, and I think we are porous in our activities and moving from one place to another, but uh, we don't want to be identified as tourists. Um, and the, the best manifestation of this is this plant that I, I remember leaving in San Francisco in 2005, uh, and it's, it's, a, it's a succulent called Tillandsia. And I like the fact that it actually thrives without being rooted to the ground. Um, I've, it's since died, unfortunately, but I have replaced it with another, yet another one in my office, which is even more tendril-like. Anyway, that's my presentation. Thank you. Uh, so my name is Jeff Hao. I'm uh, from Taiwan originally. Uh, and, but uh, today I'm going to speak more broadly about uh, cities in uh, East Asia. Okay. And so at the risk of uh, kind of oversimplifying, I'd like to argue that there are two, uh, at least two kinds of uh, Asian city. Uh, on one hand, the master plan city. Uh, as in the case of uh, the Lu Jiazui district uh, in Shanghai. 
and um, the city of the architects and buildings as uh, in the case of uh, the CCTV uh, headquarters in uh, Beijing. Uh, and not, there are many other, other examples, uh, the Moore Tower in Roppongi, uh, Tokyo, uh, the city of the new uh, C uh, CBDs uh, in shopping malls, and as in the case of the Xinyi district uh, in uh, Taipei, uh, the city of the planned uh, high-rise uh, housing complex uh, in Hong Kong, uh, and also in Seoul. And uh, something that is reminiscent of uh, you know, the Kubuji's you know, radiant city, and the verticality of these places reflect a, uh, not only just kind of uh, a verticality in terms of its form, uh, but also in terms of the political and economic hierarchy uh, that produce uh, these places. And so that's kind of one kind of Asian city. Uh, and then on the other hand, uh, there's a different kind of Asian city, a city I think that kind of Lucio kind of alluded to uh, in some of her slides, kind of the everyday places in, uh, in which the life of ordinary people uh, is performed uh, on the ground. Uh, in these kind of seemingly kind of mundane uh, you know, spaces, uh, spaces that you know lack uh, a, a strongly kind of apparent order uh, structure uh, and the kind of kind of iconography that is kind of associated often with uh, the vertical uh, city making, and as such they have often been uh, neglected or under uh, theorized. Um, while these places may be uh, messy uh, and you know, chaotic, uh, they're often uh, you know, quite inexpen inexpensive and accessible and therefore uh, kind of full of people, uh, vitality, uh, and energy. These are um, p spaces that the ordinary uh, people can shape through a variety of activities uh, that can be as simple as these two uh, gentlemen uh, playing chess uh, in the street corner uh, in Beijing. Uh, or the ra this ramen stand uh, that transform uh, the function and character of the sidewalks uh, in front of the uh, Shinjuku station uh, in Tokyo. Uh, and some of these uh, kind of people may places may be mundane and trivial, uh, but they are also uh, at the same time uh, sometimes quite extraordinary. Uh, in Taipei, uh, the top tourist attraction is not the Taipei 101, the formerly uh, was tourist building, uh, but actually this residential streets. Uh, that goes from this during the day uh, to something like this uh, in the evening. Uh, it's basically a night market where uh, uh, there are thousands uh, of visitors uh, every night uh, and pretty much all year long. And, uh, but the market itself is still uh, illegal, at least the street kind of portion of it uh, is. And uh, so every once in a while the cops will come by uh, and when that happens the, uh, the vendor would pack up and disappear in a matter of seconds. Uh, leaving the tourists uh, wondering what had just happened. Um, and some of these places have been around historically uh, that uh, have bec uh, become kind of the fabric of the city. And so in Seoul, you're looking at uh, Zhong Road, uh, the, the main boulevard, the east-west kind of main uh, axis uh, that has uh, historically been used by uh, you know, the aristocrats and for other kind of ceremonial kind of purposes. Uh, and in the old days, it's back in the, uh, the Jason Dynasty, uh, when a commoner see uh, a, an aristocrat or an official uh, riding on horses, uh, he or she will have to kneel down and, and bow. Uh, so after a few times during the day, it become kind of annoying. Uh, so over time, uh, uh, folks in Seoul began to develop uh, this kind of secondary path and so that they don't have to see the horses. And so that's what is called the Pimago which literally means avoid horse alley. <laughs> and they're still around today, even though they're slowly being in kind of encroached upon by uh, larger scale developments. And, uh, and over time, uh, you know, uh, you know a, a different kind of business kind of developed and you know, for a different kind of, kind of clientele and became this kind of alternative kind of social space uh, for people. Uh, but unfortunately, places like this, uh, and not just in Seoul, but you know, in Hong Kong, in uh, in Japan, in, in Taipei, are uh, rapidly kind of disappearing, and largely due to redevelopment projects. Uh, for example, in Seoul, that's been catalyzed by new improvements. Uh, since it's in this case the, by the Chongyechong uh, Restoration Project, that uh, runs through the center of the city, uh, and uh, through neighborhoods like this. And so neighborhood and business that have been around for a generation are now being uh, slated for redevelopment. 
Uh, in other cities like uh, Shanghai, neighborhoods have already been uh, demolished uh, to make way for uh, the homes of a rising economic class. And so again, neighborhood that had been around for generations uh, has now been kind of reduced to uh, rubbles. And uh, in Hong Kong, Wan Chai, uh, which is uh, on the Hong Kong Island, uh, very close to the financial uh, center of the city, uh, it's now the epic center of a large scale kind of transformation uh, in the city. And uh, uh, Li Dong Street, which uh, actually no longer exists today, uh, and was uh, located in uh, Wan Chai, is one of the many uh, communities uh, in the city that have uh, lost two uh, developments. And there are actually over 200 redevelopment projects in the city uh, in which existing communities and their social spaces are being uh, uprooted. And uh, Li Dong Street was best known to, uh, as to the outside world as the wedding card uh, street, where you can find a small print shop uh, that produce wedding cards. And, uh, and these are places that you can email, you can you know, fax uh, you know, from places like Vancouver, Canada, and get your know, wedding card printed in a few days and send it to you by mail. Um, and so in this place, the Urban Renewal Authority in Hong Kong has worked with the developers to build uh, high-rise apartment complexes um, and through some kind of negotiation, uh, there was some protest by the local people. Uh, they agreed to kind of this kind of token one-stop uh, uh, wedding uh, theme mall called the Wedding City that's now going to be constructed on the ground floor, uh, but still with the high-rise housing uh, on top. And so what has been uh, threatened here is not just the fa physical fabric of the city, but also the livelihood of people. And so these are vendors that are, are still, uh, some of them are still around uh, in the neighborhood. And, uh, but even the vendors are slowly being uh, uh, kind of uh, mm -hmm. being kind of regulated, and their footprints are being asked to uh, reduce. And so, you know, vendors and businesses that rely on the places, the customers, the, the networks of uh, relationship, um, and you're looking at the protest, you know, banners that are hung across the uh, the alley. And uh, so the emerging Asian city uh, is uh, therefore, uh, you know, I argue, a, a con contested city, a city undergoing profound uh, structural transformation in economic and spatial terms. And it's driven by uh, both global capital and as well as global political process. Uh, and is a contestation about uh, urban, go urban governance and uh, democratic practices. And, uh, and that consultation is, uh, I believe, at the center of the process that will come to define the emerging city of tomorrow. Thank you. Okay, shall we? All right, I got a question for you. So what, uh, so what is vertical and horizontal in, in kind of from your perspective? And, and how is that relevant to our discussion? I guess if, if I were to look at the urban landscape in Manila, I, you know, I, I was, I've been going now pretty much regularly every year. Um, and every time there's new high rises, but I see them as kind of sh uh, like these empty, shallow kind of edifices because the teeming masses are just chock-a-block next to them. Um, and, um, it's it's a I guess my connection with it would be one of a kind of I have a dilemma a kind of a psychological dilemma because I'm no longer there but I'm conflicted with uh, on the one hand um, this uh, sort of obvious signs of economic progress but it's also very much tainted because the Philippines is a very corrupt country um, and the the residual effects of the Marcus regime continues to hold sway. Um, and now, in fact, I was just reading in a, recently that, um, you know, our president now is the son of uh, Nino Aquino, who was murdered, um, allegedly by Marcos and his men. And uh, now um, he, Marcos's son, who is in his 50s, is is, is going to potentially running for president. So it's, it's these kind of fiefdoms, political fiefdoms and, that continue. Um, and so it's, it's, it's about who you know, it's about who you, uh, you are the son of, the daughter of, and, and you, you, know, you get free passes. Uh, so I, it, 
that whole so it, it's it's sim symbolic for me when I go there and I see these buildings I'm thinking what family built this you know and I know and it's either three families one of three um, and that rule the Philippines and own it um, but then of course I live here now and I see I still see um, signs of the kind of in a way maybe much more uh, coexistence kind of a you know it wasn't so drastically different uh, that I could still, I, you know, we didn't have a car until I was in college, so I would take public transportation, and I was very much on street level, so to speak. I wasn't in, a, in an insulated environment. Um, and then now, of course, I come in, and my classmates, who are these socialites uh, from high school, um, come and they say, oh, my driver will pick you up, you know, and I, and I say, oh, well, it's okay, I'll, <laughs> I'll just take a cab. So it's, uh, it's these kinds of values that I think are constantly in conflict uh, because of what you know, what I have experienced here and what I am having to, you know, again, I mean, you can get used to it, I would imagine, even if you're just there for a week, have a driver drive you around, uh, go up to these high rises where suddenly, you know, you're no longer in these verdant estates where you have really green, beautiful green gardens and uh, vegetation, and suddenly it's all these vertical structures, and I, I miss that. I miss the fact that I could go in and I could smell the grass, of, you know, when, my, when I was in high school and I would go to my classmates' houses. So it's a, it's a constant kind of, I guess, uh, uh, it's, it's much more complicated. It's, it's always been complicated, I think. If you ask any Filipino, they always have to uh, say, I, I don't know, I, I like it, but I don't like it. Um, I, I yeah, go, I'm, go ahead. No, because I, I guess I wanted to follow on Jeff's question. One of the ways in which you introduced us to, the, to a kind of image of the Philippines and your location in it in this very fragmented I I island nation. And then we looked at your sort of typographic um, work, which had another kind of perforated island quality. I don't, you know, don't want to make too much of biography, but I imagine that that's an intentional story you're telling. So. I, I go back to sort of why I thought you might be in, interesting interlocutors of each other is because I was very curious about the way in which you manage a page and your interest in typography and how, in a sense, the vertical and the horizontal gets thought of in the page in, in sort of comparable ways to which Jeff is reading an urban landscape. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. How is the urban landscape kind of migrating into the page of your work? So it's just extending yeah. your question. Um, just to follow up, I mean, I think it's very interesting. You're both giving us, um, in a different language and in a different visual language through your slides and images, a di uh, an interesting kind of mapping. You know, yours, I mean, what I took away from yours is all, all the little side streets uh, that you say are disappearing within these cities. And then I felt the same way with the typography and the, the visuals that you gave us with um, the fragmented words and these isolated mm -hmm. letters here and there, like icono, class, uh, non conform, you know, it's just, and then that um, Philippine, uh, Philippines cross with the word, you know. <laughs> religion. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I took it less as religion, more as, um, I'm, I'm obviously there is that connection too, but, you know, as the vertical and the horizontal, because, you know, I knew that this was what this conversation was about. But, but you know, it's like two very interesting ma maps of a city that you're both kind of, or, or, or maybe experience of cultural identity that you're, mm -hmm. um, offering to us that I thought was interesting to, to, to talk about. Yeah, but then you have the malls, right? And, um, malls. Malls. <laughs> yes, and uh, so there's this, <laughs> in Hong Kong it spreads out to the street yeah. with the mid-levels escalators and, and um, uh, so there is a, uh, a, a in-between diagonal, transsectional, uh, um, multi-level 
horizontal but vertical atrium kinds of space that you know are, are just keep on pushing the limits with like extended escalators like at Langham Place and now uh, Terminal 21 I'll show in Bangkok and um, so for me it's uh, uh, verticality is a necessity given the density of the planet and the footprints of cities and things like that and um, and uh, and there's towers that are kind of designed on the <laughs> New York model, and you either have a tower or a brownstone, or and, and but in Asia, I see much more hybridization of the verticality and horizontality rather than either or situation. I don't know if you agree or disagree, or and certainly um, as a graphic designer, you're always integrating the two. And how can we get you to design a, a city that has <laughs> the integration of the vertical and the horizontal? Yeah. Uh, well. Yes, so obviously the actual kind of physical fabric of a city, the experience is, is much more multi-layer. It's not just vertical and horizontal, right? Uh, but so I, I use that more as a, as, a, as a rubric, as a vehicle to talk about, you know, uh, and to get back to, I, th I think, a since point about the power structure, right? And I think this is, you know, kind of, we still kind of alluded to that as well. Uh, and, and I think there's another layer as well, because I think often people are, at least from my experience in Taiwan, are very, and I think in other places as well, are very conflicted. Uh, at the same time, they want their you know, city to be you know, modern, to be contemporary, to have all the amenities. Uh, and they, uh, but when it comes to uh, uh, you know, like entertainment and uh, you know, everyday life, they go to the vendors at the street corner, they go to the night market, and, uh, but, and somehow they are, they are at the same time conflicted and at the same time they are able to uh, reconcile the two. Uh, and so that's kind of a, a, uh, an experience and, and skill that you almost have to have uh, when you live there. And, um, and I think that's what makes this you know, interesting and, and, and complex. Uh, but at the same time that often, that kind of comfort uh, in going from one, you know, to the other, uh, disguise the uh, the hegemony, the power structure in the city that makes it what it is, and that's the thing that I'm trying to challenge. Um, yeah, I think that the the whole. Um I guess that the prog the, the signs of progress to me uh, when I said earlier they they were sort of they they felt hollow because uh, some of the construction is really um, uh, it's not well made it's all done very quickly uh, when when the Marcuses were in power Imelda Marcos would have buildings go up in three months and of course it would collapse and kill workers and you know there were all these tragedies that happened um, with these buildings and so I feel. Somehow, you know, I, I want the sort of authenticity that I grew up with uh, without this kind of manufactured, um, you know, kind of overlay. But you can't help it, as you said, you know, it's, it's, it, 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 people need to show evidence that, yeah, yeah, you know, we're doing really well. And in fact, the Philippines, because of our English fr fr proficiency, is like the number one, um, what do you call call center in the world? I mean, you call United, <laughs> and I, you know, like I want to trip them. I said, "Are you from the Philippines?" They don't answer. I said, uh, "Yes, <laughs> ma'am," and <laughs> I could tell right away. <laughs> so, you know, and my f friends of friends have kids who work in these call centers. They make a lot of money, and you know, so it, it's a. Uh, and I'm thinking, you know, when did this whole phenomenon happen that we became now this sort of outsourcing place? Uh, and we also were are the biggest labor class in the Middle East. You know, I mean, you go to Italy, you go to London, you have maids, cleaning ladies, uh, Egypt, same thing. And it's it's kind of a it's, it's tra oh, yeah, yeah, right. <laughs> yes. it's tragic. So I you know all of these things. Of course, there's it it feeds the industry. That's why uh, there's money from overseas coming in. But it isn't really about what made it not great at one point, but it was at least on its way uh, in the 60s. And you just reminded me of the great Sunday in Hong Kong. Like oh, Filipinas. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I know. Same in Rome. I mean, at St. Peter's, you know, it's Sunday, right? So the, na yeah. the, the maids are of their day off, and I walk across St. Peter's Square, and there are like groups of them, and I like smell, and I say, What's, what are we cooking? And uh, yeah, it's, 
and I you know it's 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 it breaks up families too. You know they leave their yeah. their kids, their husbands, yeah. spouses, and for, to make a better living. Uh, one of the things that unified your presentations for me is literally, literally graphics, uh, and and uh, you know the city is a canvas for expressionism, graphic expressionism, and I, I think it would be fair to say that many South Asian cities are sort of creating this almost an identity in the way signage is so dominant in cities, vertical signage, uh, appropriated signage. Um, and, and all the way from say, Shinjuku to you know, Thailand, you, you, you have the, it's almost a challenge to the Western city in the way where the control over buildings, the control of urban form is almost dominated by graphics of all sorts. And there are a number of them. There are franchised ones, Kentucky Fried Chicken, McDonald's. There are populist ones. Uh, Shinjuku is blasted with them all over. Then you have the, the, the ones you see up there on the slide, which are spontaneous ad hoc ones. And then there are remnants of uh, very indigenous signages, crowns, uh, so on and so forth. Uh, so I wanted to pose this because from a point of view of our life here, where as, as one aspect of urbanism is about controlling the, uh, the amount of expressionism we give our cities in the so-called in the so-called sort of almost manipulating it on one hand, but also believing that the franchise designer has the authority or the right to make a judgment, at least here, in deciding how much signage is done, how much is not, including billboards and so on, versus when you go to cities like this where you almost have no control. So just to provoke, so where, where do you think there's a feedback loop between, say, the absolute approach to these kind of things in the US versus what you learn from these places? Well, you know, as a graphic designer, one of my uh, one of my capabilities, I guess, is branding. I hate to use that word, but it's identity systems. When I was a student, we called it identity systems. So it's logos and all the applications to signage. Uh, I don't do a lot. I, I have not done big corporate mega identity systems because I personally have a problem with with standardizing. You know, and I think it's because I'm, you know, I, I like, I like uh, vernacular stuff. I, I, I really am influenced by, you know, what I see that is much more, uh, you know, much more immediate. And, you know, I like when the color is not well thought out and no, but no design police has ever entered the picture. Um, so I think, for example, in, in Times Square, I mean, if you think about, you know, blasting it with messages, that's, that's your one example, and Las Vegas, of course. Um, there was one artist I remember who did a project on Las Vegas where he took out every verbal information. I don't know, does anybody, does that ring a bell with anybody? Yeah, not that one. It's a more contemporary artist who actually took a picture of the strip and took out every Ver verbal information, every written information. So you're just left with with yeah. with with hardware, so to speak, and that's what was left. And I think that's really interesting because you know, I even in Times Square, the cacophony of that is also standardized. I mean, can you imagine? You know, Ernst and Young has their billboard and it's blasting. And if it was down in Wall Street, it's not. It's going to be low key. It's going to be etched in stone or whatever. But uh, the standard. Uh, of, of Times Square has to be, you know, X number of decibels and X number of lights or, you know, to compete with Las Vegas. And, and so my personal take on it is, um, you know, again, it's, it's a personal choice that I feel that, you know, if I were to design an identity, I actually like this sort of kinetic approach where I, I leave a lot to the client, so to speak, and I tell them, I give you a template and make mine better. You know, I, I, I don't want to dictate and I, I and uh, I feel that they, if they get it, they can in fact be exponentially better. If they get it, if they get the kind of foundational rubric that I'm, I'm sort of creating. Um, I had a, a question over here. Uh, my question is about an issue that I imagine is very important in the Philippines and in any South Asian city, and that's climate change. And I, I just wanted to know what the conversation is on the street, what the government is doing about it in, in all of these cities. You know, is it like the U.S. where a lot of officials have their head in the sand and it, it doesn't even register in level of importance, or it's just an election year issue? Uh, but, and, and also people at the street aren't necessarily talking about it as much as they should. So what's the level of conversation and, and what's being done about it? Thank you. Uh, well, uh, 
I don't think the level of conversation is, is what we <laughs> would like it to be. I mean, and that just that I think the contact is slightly different. At least, uh, I mean, I can speak for Taiwan. Uh, you know, we have typhoons every year. And we, so we're used to these kind of, you know, natural disasters. And, uh, and in a way, there's a degree of comfort to it already. It's, you know, uh, you know when typhoon comes, people actually go out and watch it, uh, <laughs> rather than trying to stay home and, and, and it's, you know, and be safe. Uh, and so, uh, so to that extent, you know, they, uh, the, the issue of climate change is not being taken that seriously. It just seems another uh, uh, things that we have to deal with. Uh, and we are, you know, the city actually well uh, equipped with, well, for most of the time, with, you know, in dealing with, uh, you know, typhoons and, you know, lot, you know and not just typhoon, that earthquake. Uh, and so, I mean, these are things that have happened uh, often now. I mean, in Taipei, like, earthquake is every month. You can feel it. Uh, and these are kind of sensible kind of earthquakes. And uh, so the, the culture and the, ins the institutions are uh, kind of already conditions to deal with these kind of you know frequent uh, uh, kind of disasters, and to a degree, I think there's the people are becoming too comfortable. Although I think the scale of disasters have actually uh, changed in recent years, uh, and so I think that may uh, uh, require people to you know be you know, the sensitive you know the sensibility may may, sh may shift, hopefully, but that's uh, we're not quite there yet. I mean, I would say the same for the Philippines. I mean, we are, you know, in the so-called ring of fire. So we, we not only get the earthquakes, we get, uh, when Jeff was saying, you know, typhoons, one is on the way out, another one's coming in. That's my experience. Yeah. And we are, I'm looking at the eye of the storm, you know, of the hurricane, I'm thinking, okay, just relax, because there's another one coming. So we are, in a way, um, conditioned with that but the but the uh, the shifts maybe i think are, are probably more drastic but the frequency of climate disturbances of a magnitude that is maybe unthinkable or maybe, maybe now thinkable because of sandy and all these recent things but in my in my country and houses are made so flimsily i mean it's amazing that in a country that is on a zone that is uh, earthquake prone uh, you know subject to typhoons one after another, people still build with very light materials. And so it's, you know, is that resilience? <laughs> I don't know. You just sort of like, oh, we'll build again, you know, because yet another shanty town comes up. So it, it's, a, it, it's a big problem. And, uh, you know, for a country of the, with, with a population problem, first of all, I think, is, is a big deal. And, you know, my country has church and state locked in. Okay, and so we had a cardinal many years ago whose name was Cardinal Sin, and he was a Chinese guy. <laughs> His yeah. name was Cardinal Sin, <laughs> you know, and uh, and he was, I guess, maybe one of the last. I mean, he was quite conservative. So I, you know, now there was a man in his fifties who was, in fact, one of the ten candidates for a pope, uh, who was apparently quite, you know, maybe may, less con less traditional, and maybe, you know, so he can, in fact, separate. And, and, and espouse maybe family planning. You know, that's, that's been a very controversial issue because the government wants something, but the church rules everything. Uh, I wanted to come back to something Jeff said a little while ago. You were talking about sort of vertical living, horizontal living, mm -hmm. and you're talking about how people reconcile the two. Mm -hmm and maybe in some places like Singapore, Hong Kong, where they're very used to it. Mm -hmm. But I know in many parts of the world, there is a certain horizontality of living where they uh, live very publicly, open space, even live with livestock in cities. Mm -hmm. And I wonder if in some cases there's actually a kind of tension on, uh, between a vertical lifestyle and a horizontal lifestyle. And I wonder if you've come across that. And do they actually really reconcile or is there a kind of not necessarily a bad tension, but kind of a tension between how you live in a very vertical city and how you live, uh, or used to live, let's say, very horizontally out on the street in public space where you socialize and so forth. And I don't know if you found that in different places. Well, I mean, there, there, uh, I mean, you know, places like, like, like Hong Kong, they are, you know, like, the low income, the, the poor people have actually live in high rises. So I mean, you know, so you cannot associate high rise with a particular you know, class of people. I mean, you know, but uh, they are more uh, separate by location, 
location is actually much more important. Uh, so the, you know the richer people tend to occupy the central area, and the, you know people you know uh, the lower class tend to you know get pushed out into the outskirts, um, and uh, and then there are uh, uh, you know the well, I, I think in case in cases like uh, Seoul, uh, maybe you know maybe not the, the I think the living uh, spaces. You know, might not be the best ex example. I think the, uh, uh, the the places where people conduct business uh, might be a better uh, way of kind of articulate, articulating that tension. Uh, so you know, so the, the high rises, the corporate headquarters, versus you know the uh, the shops that make you know signage. You know, going back to you know signage uh, in in the center of Seoul and the tension between the two. Uh, it's very strong. I mean, the, uh, the, the shop that, that I show in the slide, you know, with all the uh, you know, narrow alleyways, uh, the they actually occupy the very center of the city. That is that that all the you know the corporation are eyeing on as you know uh, places you know put their office where uh, where you know they can put their uh, you know, high rise condo uh, there as well. So I think you know the the, the spaces that are associated with. Uh, you know uh, the business, the commerce, the, the yeah, that's probably where the tension uh, is the strongest. Uh, I just want to <coughs> add an anecdote. And from uh, from Bangkok, it's quite an interesting one, and I think um, uh, and it's in to answer to your question, Asim. Unless you really have to go to the toilet. <laughs> um, it's. Um, uh, so the, there's actually a taboo against someone's feet being above your head in Thailand. So oh. the hierarchy is reversed. Mm -hmm. and, um, um, and it wasn't until there was a soap opera that took place in Hong Kong in the 1980s oh. where people saw high-rise living as a status symbol that the condo market became mm -hmm. successful in, in Taiwan. Mm -hmm. So um, Right, right. Thailand? Uh, Thailand, sorry. Thailand, yeah. Yeah, there's a transformation that occurred in, in Korea as well. I mean, the, you know, high rise is something that people were not accustomed to, and so until that the higher, you know, the upper, you know, class uh, adopted as a as a you know as a you know, lifestyle, then the middle class begin to accept that. Yeah. yeah. As opposed to the British forcing on the court. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Okay.